Thank you very much. Uh, I'm assuming from silence you can hear me. It's a great pleasure to be up here uh, today and um, well north of Wigan. I'm a southerner and to be up here amongst friendly faces is really a pleasure. Uh, nice to be with you. Um, uh, I have uh, immediate problems with my very eloquent alternative speaker. Immediate problems in how he defines things. Because um, I'm a he used the term multilateralist. I'm a multilateralist. I believe that countries should negotiate and agree in common on steps towards disarmament. I'm also a bilateralist. I think two countries, as have done before, uh, can make very sensible arrangements between themselves. I think that's very helpful. I'm also a regionalist. I think that areas of the world, like the European Union, can come to some sensible conclusions about disarmament. There's nothing divisive that you've got to be one or the other. I'm a unilateralist in that I think that every country is capable of taking its own independent steps that help towards disarmament. Everybody can. What the steps are is another matter. But, but to say that somehow unilateralism is, is somehow out as a philosophy, it's nonsense. Uh, the arms race, and it is a race, did not develop as a result of a series of multilateral agreements. You'll have, a, you'll have a skyrocket and I'll have something else. We'll sign it and we'll both develop them. The whole arms race goes up as a result of individual unilateral decisions by particular countries. And it's ended either by multilateral, bilateral, regional, or unilateral steps forward. And we've had some very sensible uh, bilateral and multilateral steps forward. In fact, the, the, the agreement that's been referred to, uh, the, uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, is extremely important. It's a great pity that we don't observe it. It says in Article 6, on the, each of the parties to the treaty, and we are a party to the treaty, undertakes to pursue negoci negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and on treaty on complete and general disarmament. That's an obligation which we undertook in 1968, but nothing's happened as a consequence. Last year, 2017, there was a major meeting of a number of countries, um, uh, and I think the final total now is 122 countries agreeing a program of sensible disarmament, nuclear and conventional disarmament. Um, it wasn't a pacifist thing, I'm not a pacifist, not a pacifist thing, it was an international treaty. You'd think that this would be the opportunity for a country like Britain to weigh in with the help of all the other agencies, churches and trade unions, and say, great, let's join in. On the contrary, we want to have absolutely nothing to do with it, and nor does President Trump have, want to have anything to do with it. Because actually the world is not divided into those who think that nuclear weapons are wicked and immoral and should go. It's actually divided into people who think they should go and others who think they should stay. And that may be the, the uh, they present you with an illusion that they believe in nuclear disarmament, but they actually don't. Um, uh, I think in this country, it's manifestly clear from both the major parties, or all the major parties, what the position is. When we had a vote, uh, I forget how many, two years ago now, on replacing Trident, which was passed substantially in the House of Commons, and it will cost 205 billion pounds, billion pounds. The National Health Service could be shaken from its roots uh, with 205 billion pounds. We could make public transport sensible, but straight through the House of Commons, 205 billion pounds. How is that compatible with the negotiations in good faith that we've agreed in the Non-Proliferation Treaty? It's not compatible, but actually there's a kind of nationalist, belligerent, militarist power in this country that drives in that direction. And actually, I think in a way, God bless him, it goes back to Ernest Bevin, or probably long before him. But I remember very well reading about Clement Attlee, who was very dubious. He wrote a brilliant letter after the first bombs went off. The end of August, 1945, Attlee said, this genie has got to go back in the bottle or we're all doomed. It was a wonderful letter. And he called a meeting in Downing Street. And Ernest Bevin was late. The meeting 
was actually quite productive because the civil servants there and the cabinet ministers there were all of a mind that this country should not waste time getting more nuclear weapons, we'd only incite the rest of the world, and so on and so on and so on. But Bevin had been given a real rollicking uh, by the American ambassador, as you suggested uh, correctly, because uh, of the spies, Fuchs and others, who had penetrated the British nuclear uh, system and knew what was going on. And the Americans thought we were an unreliable ally, and they refused to have any further uh, sharing of, of nuclear negotiations with this country from the United States of America. And Bevin was brought in and told this very abruptly by the American ambassador. And he came in late to the Downing Street meeting in a fury. And he said in front of the whole meeting, it's all written down, I don't care what everybody says here. He said, I want them over here and I want them with a bloody great Union Jack on top. That was his expression, Union Jack on top. The root problem of the nuclear arms race is not I'm going to be more secure or you're going to be less secure, but I'm going to be more important. My nation is going to be more important if my flag is on top of it. And that's exactly what has, has subsequently happened. And the world has become more insecure as a consequence, much more insecure as a consequence. Uh, nuclear weapons, what, what do they actually do apart from national prestige? What do they do? Who's going to be lunatic enough to fire nuclear weapons at other people? Well, lunatics and suicidal people and non-state actors. All the, the kind of people that actually our nuclear weapons are not designed to operate against anyway. How do you actually nuke ISIS? You can't nuke ISIS. They're not, not available to be nuked. How do you nuke any other non-state actor that takes the nuclear weapons, you can't do anything with them. So there's a whole w w raft of people who, who nuclear weapons are relevant, not relevant to at all. And then there's another lot of people who actually are quite happy to go to heaven or somewhere or other by committing suicide. And that's part of the military doctrine of a number of different non-state groups. How do you stop suicidal people committing suicide? If you fire nuclear weapons at them, you, you help them on their way. It's not a very intelligent way to deal with suicidal people. How do you stop actually gross misperceptions? And we never hear about any of this. This is all part of nuclear history. We are very lucky in the Cuba crisis not to have a world war. Why? Not because of Khrushchev and Kennedy. They talk sense, but because of a Soviet submarine, which after Khrushchev and Kennedy had agreed the settlement and so on, the missiles in Turkey would be incorporated and so on. And at that stage, an American aircraft carrier was on the surface and there was a Soviet submarine out of touch with Moscow, no communications. And what the aircraft carrier was trying to do was to tell them to come up, it's all over. And they dropped Mills bombs into the sea going boom, 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 as if that would indicate. The captain of the Soviet submarine thought that these were depth charges. Well, you would. His number two thought they were depth charges. The submarine crew, half of them had fainted in a temperature of over 40 degrees centigrade. Half the crew were out of action anyway. The third officer only is the one who saved the world because the third officer said, maybe if we do this, maybe we are responding to a, a peace signal and maybe we'll be starting World War III. At that time, the nuclear torpedoes had already been placed in the tubes ready to go. And he stopped it because he had the key. If he hadn't had the key, God knows what would have happened. We had almost similar uh, event in 1983 when uh, Reagan was doing his tub thumping and uh, they had a great NATO exercise in, uh, in West Germany, up and down. Well, how did the Soviets know whether or not it's an exercise or whether it's a preemptive maneuvering before they move in? And there was an um, uh, observer, senior observer in a Soviet plant called Petrov, and Petrov was, was looking at the, the western sky, and he saw in the western sky five missiles coming from the west to the east. His orders were to tell Andropov in Moscow that there was an attack coming, but Petrov wouldn't. Half his crew, his bunker, said, you better do it. Half his crew said, don't, and he didn't, and he waited 45 minutes, and the, by that time, these things were getting much closer. And at the end of 45 minutes, it turned out to be some bizarre cloud formation and there were no missiles in the air at all. If Petrov had done his duty and told Andropov, 
I can't say it would have happened, but the chances are Andropov would have said, well, fire five back again. That'll teach them. And that would have been World War III. So that's the kind of thing that the nuclear era does nothing whatever to protect us against. What are, what are we, why are we in this country doing this? I think we're going back to the Bevin thing. That's what it is. Maybe it's the, the trade unions. Maybe it's the trade unions um, who have an enormous influence, of course, in the Labour Party. Uh, the jobs involved are quite substantial, and uh, we don't want to talk about them. I've got a clipping here. I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody with this, but I think this is an important clipping. This is a, 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 um, a, a German in the middle of the war. This is a German uh, industrial organization talking about concentration camps. We acknowledge the receipt of your order for five triple furnaces, including two electric elevators for raising the corpses and one emergency elevator. For putting bodies into the furnace, we suggest simply a metal fork moving on cylinders. For transporting the corpses, we suggest light carts using wheels. For business, it's business, jobs, business. Now, I'm not saying that people who make Trident submarines are in the same class, but they've got to think about this, because Trident submarines, if it all goes wrong, kind of precisely means this, incinerating large numbers of humanity. There's a moral issue of this, which we must, not, we must not never, never forget. I think we have a really good opportunity now in this country, if we want to, raise the issue seriously to start reversing the nuclear arms race. But precisely because why? Because we, we don't have an independent nuclear weapon. It's a, it's a joke of the Daily Mail, the Times, and the Telegraph. It's a joke. How could you possibly say we have an independent nuclear weapon when we have to go to the United States and say, I need another set of missiles on which to put my warheads? Because we don't have any missiles of our own, and no one pretends that we're going to make them. So we have to go to the United States. Harold Wilson, in one of his better moments, said, we live in a Moss, we have a Moss Bros deterrent. I don't know any of you old enough to have used Moss Bros. I did in my day when I was a naughty young man of about 15. I used to go down and hire a, a dinner jacket, a Moss Bros. You hired it on the Friday and you, you got up to whatever mischief you wanted on the Saturday and on the Monday you went back to Moss Bros and handed in your dinner jacket and you paid out for 25 pounds in those days, probably about 500 pounds nowadays. But that's what Harold Wilson meant. It wasn't ours. And it's not. The other nuclear powers, there are nine of them now, nine of them have got what looks like, I think, independent nuclear systems. We don't. And therefore, we are in a strong position to be the first nuclear state to, to lead the way to join in the, the 122 and start to talking sensibly. This is, not, this is not a kind of airy-fairy nonsense. The money we're spending could transform the public services in this country, especially the National Health Service. And yet, hardly ever does it even make the connection that we have a hospital, the Whittington Hospital in North London, and there have been y y yards of correspondence about the cuts facing the Whittington Hospital, and not one letter, not one letter in the correspondence connecting it with the 205 billion. That is, until my letter went in, which it did, um, uh, to, make, to make the point. Um, we're living in different worlds, and we should be living in one world where our resources are shared. How am I doing for time? I've got to shut up yet. No, not, not quite. Not quite, not no, quite yet. Well, I think we have a, we're, I think this kind of debate is very helpful because it, it brings out all the issues. You don't have to agree with me about everything or my friend here about everything, but at least we can talk about it and stop the silence because that's what we have is silence. Um, we had it when I became Secretary of CND in 1979. Nobody was interested in any of these issues. It took the cruise missile arrival in 1981 or so to suddenly wake everybody up. Well, I think we're on the edge of that now. We could have a very different world if we put the nuclear arms race behind us and, and acknowledge that nuclear weapons do not increase anybody's security. They increase everybody's insecurity. And I think if we start that, get that message over loudly, the trouble is, and I say as a member of a number of charities and things, the trouble is the legislation in this country is very clever. It's very clever to stop you linking issues that should be linked. Um, if you start talking in Oxfam or Christian Aid or CAFOD, you start talking about poverty in connection with the arms race, 
oh no, that won't do, you'll lose your charitable status, you'll lose a third of your income. So it keeps people extremely quiet. I was in the, when I was in the army, I was in the, in the Royal Tank Regiment. The Royal Tank Regiment Museum down at Bovington, Bovington Tank Museum, is a registered charity. It's an organ of, of military thinking. Uh, it's a char charity. Campaign for nuclear disarmament will never be a charity, will never be fit into the, the rules. So we have to be aware that, that public opinion in this country is being directed in certain ways by governments both left and right. And it's, we, we need to challenge that silence and get people to wake up. We could have a different world. We don't have to blow each other up, uh, but it takes much more activity from more people than we're getting at the moment. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Hello, my name's Brenda Ashton. Um, I'd like to ask the speakers what effect they think Brexit, um, I don't know whether I, you said something about it at the beginning because I wasn't here, or potential Brexit will have upon nuclear disarmament and the, uh, whether being part of Eurotom is a good thing or a bad thing. Well, this is all guessology, isn't it? Um, uh, I'm a, a non-Brexiter. I'm for remaining, if that's what a non-Brexiter is. I think that... Uh, <laughs> I think all non-Brexiters should make quite clear in public statements that the European Union was formed to stop wars between Germany and France. That's why it was formed. Completely forgotten now, you'd think it was an amalgamation of Woolworths and Marks and Spencers. It's a, it was a peace initiative to start with, and that's what we need to remember. Um, I do, uh, it's not a Brexit matter, but I must say more common sense on nuclear weapons is coming out of Scotland and it's coming out of England at the moment. But that doesn't mean to say I'm a Brexiter. I'd like their common sense to come and infect us a bit more down here. Hi, my name's Alex. I'm a member of uh, Lisa and Morton Labour Party. Um, I'm just wondering what the opinion opinions are on the current situation with North Korea, America, and apparently Russia getting involved in it as well. Um, do you see that as a dangerous flashpoint? I think it's incredibly dangerous. You've got two semi-lunatics with enough material to blow the world up. That's extremely dangerous. And they're bluffing away on, the, on television. I think, but nobody thinks it's dangerous. They just think they're two lunatics. And ha, 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 they might well be on, on question time or something. It's a joke. But it's not a joke. They've got the ability. So I think it, it's, it's a much more scary time than we realize. Well, I, I'm very encouraged by this afternoon. Uh, I love to see a full church. Um, it's, not, it's not quite the sort of full church I had in mind. But anyway, delighted to see you all here. Um, I am myself um, uh, in a constituency, which you may, you may know well, is Upper Holloway. Do you know who the MP is for Upper Holloway? You ought to. Jeremy Corbyn is, the, is our MP, and a very decent local MP he was and is, um, and uh, would come to every bazaar or jumble sale or organ recital or God knows what else, Jeremy would turn up, usually looking rather scruffy, but anyway, he'd turn up. And uh, when, it, when it came to him standing with the, four, the other four, I thought, oh, well, God, this is like the Grand National with a 100 to 1 outsider. Well, he came in, didn't he, 100 to 1 outsider, and, and he won. And I think one of the most remarkable things he said so far in the, on this debate was, I would not press the button. Now that's a really remarkable thing to say. I will not press the button. Knocks the bottom out of the whole nuclear dis disarmament debate. Because if you won't press the button, what the hell are they all for? And I think that that kind of simple logic is something that's got to get over to people. I think the nuclear weapon issue ought to come out of the silence it's been in. And that very much depends on people like you and me. And it's not just a matter of joining CND. I'm all for joining CND, excellent, good idea. But this is the Houseman's Peace Diary and Directory. It comes out every year. It costs nine pounds when you buy it before the end of June. It costs one pound from July onwards. So get yourself a one pound copy, because the, back, the, back, the index at the back 
carries all the addresses and names of different organizations. Um, for instance, I'm quite involved in X services um, They call themselves Veterans for Peace now. It's a very good organization. I'm involved in the campaign against the arms trade. I'm involved in the United Nations Association, involved in Pax Christi. Everybody can get into something or other that's making a difference. Even if you can't join an organization, you can get a copy of the charter or the program and stick it up in the, in the notice board locally. So there's so much to be done for ordinary people. I am quite disappointed, if I may, um, uh, that we do not have in this audience um, any members of parliament who actually voted for Trident. Um, that's a pity. Uh, maybe they're all busy, but it would have been good to have had a, an active debate with those who were politically were supporting this affair, but they didn't, they didn't come to that. But I hope you'll find other means of getting this message about local newsletters, local papers, and so on. Um, I'm not the last word. He's not the last word. You've got the last word, and you can do all sorts of things to change attitudes. And I think it's very desperately important to remember that attitudes change. Um, when I was about 16, my parents thought it normal for me to be, uh, ac have access to the family cigarette box. And I would smoke in front of them watching television at 16. They must have been bonkers, but they weren't bonkers in those days. That was the way you treated people. Um, my father, I remember, took part in a debate, I remember it very well, um, about whether or not a Jewish man should be allowed to join the golf club. Imagine having such a debate now. It would be unthinkable. But, so all I'm saying is the attitudes to everything, hours of work, votes for women, all these things, anti-slavery, require public pressure at our level to get things changed. And I'm sure you'll find your own way to do that. Thank you very much indeed for having a stranger from south of Watford coming up to talk to you today. And I hope I go back safely. And thank you very much indeed.